Hello and welcome to a new video on cryptography for everybody. In today's video, we will have a look at cloud forensics. I gave this lecture as a test lecture a few weeks ago, and I thought it could be also interesting for the viewers of this channel. So I translated it from German to English, and today I will give you the test lecture about cloud forensics in this video. I structured the video or the lecture into six different parts. In the first part, we will have a look at the basic definitions. You will learn about forensics and cloud computing. Then I will give you an introduction to the traditional digital forensics and cloud computing. After that, we have three parts. Forensics in infrastructure as a service environments, then forensics in platform as a service environments, and then forensics in software as a service environments. What all these terms mean, you will also learn in this lecture. And in the end, we will have a summary and a conclusion. Let's start with the definitions. What is cloud computing? I found two definitions. One from the Gabler Economic Lexicon, retrieved on October 2023, and then a definition by the German BSI, the German Federal Office for Information Security. The first definition is that cloud computing includes technologies and business models to dynamically provide IT resources and to build their use according to flexible payment models. This method of provisioning leads to an industrialization of IT resources similar to what happened with the provisioning of electricity. Companies can reduce long-term capital expenditures for the benefit of information technology by using cloud computing. I marked a few important words here in red. So cloud computing are technologies and business models to dynamically provide IT resources. We use flexible payment models with cloud computing and cloud computing led to an industrialization of IT resources. Let's see what the BSI says about cloud computing. Cloud computing is a model that allows, as needed, anytime and anywhere to conveniently access a shared pool of configurable computing resources. For example, networks, servers, storage systems, applications, and services, which can be quickly made available with minimal management effort or little service provider interaction. Here are also marked important words. Cloud computing is a model. Very important is that we can use it anytime and anywhere. It's, it offers conveniently access. It's a configurable computing resource pool with minimal management effort or little service provider interaction. And I said it already in the introduction, we have different service models with cloud computing. We have the three big service models. We have infrastructure as a service, that is provisioning of hardware resources over the internet and the users control the operating system and the applications running on it. Users clearly are those that want to use cloud computing. And of course, then if you use infrastructure as a service, for instance, to get a server in the Amazon cloud, then you are the administrator, but you're still the user of the cloud service. But then of course, you also have users that use your services. Then we have platform as a service. That is provisioning of a platform and environment for developers to create and operate applications and services over the internet. So this model offers you a platform with application interfaces, programming interfaces, where you program your own cloud applications and deploy these into the cloud. But you're not any more responsible, for instance, for the infrastructure below the platform. And then finally, we have the software as a service model, SAAS, and that is provisioning of applications over the internet. These are used by the end user. So you don't need to program anything here. You don't have to administer anything here. You just book a software in the cloud and use it. An example for this is, for instance, the Dropbox, where you get storage in the cloud and you don't need to maintain it by yourself. It's all maintained by the software as a service provider. Now let's have a look at the definition of digital forensics. And first we have a look at the forensics. And I found this in the Gabler Economic Lexicon, also translated. The term 
Forensics originates from Latin forum, marketplace forum, in ancient Rome, legal proceedings, investigations, pronouncement of judgments, and the execution of sentence were carried out publicly in the marketplace. Today, forensics encompasses those areas of work in which criminal actions are systematically identified, analyzed, or reconstructed. I mark the most important words here. So we have the translation from the Roman marketplace forum and Forensics are those areas of work which deal with criminal, criminal actions which are systematically identified, analyzed or reconstructed. Then we have the digital forensics which are part of forensics and digital forensics is a strictly methodological analysis of data on storage media and in computer networks for the investigation of incidents, including the possibilities of strategic preparation, particularly from the perspective of the operator of an IT system. This comes from the BSI IT Forensics Guideline. And I also mark the most important words in red. These are that digital forensics are the strictly method analysis of data on storage media and in computer networks for investigation of incidents. Here I give you an overview what digital forensics are. And we have different subclasses. For instance, we have operating system forensics, malware forensics and memory forensics. We already had a video on this channel on memory forensics, also on malware. Then we have cloud forensics, network forensics, and data storage forensics. And I think all these names stand for themselves. Then we have digital multimedia forensics, where you, for instance, analyze image files, videos, and so on. We have smartphone forensics, and many more. The interesting thing for us here is I mark cloud forensics in green. This is a topic of this video, but cloud forensics consists of all these other types of forensics. So with cloud forensics, you also do operating system forensics, malware, memory, and so on, as we will see later. Now I give you an introduction to traditional digital forensics and cloud computing. What are the differences between classic IT solutions and cloud computing solutions? First, let's start with a classic IT solution. With a classic IT solution, you have a data center or different data centers, and these are housed directly on site, so in your company. The access is possible locally and remotely, so you can walk into the data center and have physical access to your service, or you can just log into a server via network and work on the server. You use your own hardware and you do your own configuration and maintenance in your own data center. So you have full control over everything in your data center. Then we have the cloud computing solution. Now the data centers are managed by the cloud provider. Only remote access is possible. So you cannot walk into your cloud and have physical access to the servers. Of course, the hardware is provided. And then depending on the cloud infrastructure that you booked, configuration and maintenance may be possible or even necessary. And the control clearly is limited and prevented by the cloud provider. Of course, this is also dependent on the service model. Here you can see a classic IT solution. You have your data center here with different servers. You have your administrator who has on-site access to the servers. Then you have a firewall that connects your servers with the internet. I, of course, made this um, here a little easier. Usually you also have a DMZ and different network partitions and so on, but we keep it simple here. The firewall connects to your internet and then the internet connects to the user who uses your service. Here we have an infrastructure as a service solution. Now we have our cloud provider here who gives you access to virtual machines, virtual servers. These virtual servers are running on one machine inside the cloud. So inside the server of the cloud provider. You also have a firewall connecting your virtual server with the internet. Now you as an administrator, you only have access through the internet to your cloud servers, to your virtual servers. And also your user has, of course, access over the internet to your virtual servers. And if you need more servers with infrastructure as a service, you just book them and you get more and more servers. That could be then spread all over the different servers of the cloud provider. 
Now we have platform as a service, which is a little different. We have now, instead of servers, applications or services that you deploy into the cloud. These are still running on a machine on the servers of the cloud provider. And of course, these are still connected through a firewall to the internet. You as an administrator also connect via the internet to the configuration and to your applications and services to configure these. The user that uses your services also connects through the internet, through the firewall to your applications or services. And finally, we have software as a service. Here, we have just the cloud. We even don't know actually how it looks. Of course, they're in the background servers, but what you do as a user, you just book a service like Dropbox, Office 365, SAP, and so on. And there's no administrative burden on you. You just book what you need, you pay for it, and it works. And everything is done by the cloud provider, clearly through the internet. Here, I found a nice comparison of traditional IT with the three cloud service models. And what I like here especially is that you can see what you as a user of cloud computing, um, deploying your services and servers to the cloud have to manage and what the service provider manages with the different service models. If you have your computing resources on site, you have your own data center, then of course you have to do everything from applications down to networking. In the infrastructure as a service model, the cloud provider now takes over networking, storage, servers, and virtualization. And you start to manage from OS level. Then in the next service model, platform as a service, also the OS, the middleware, and the runtime is maintained by the cloud provider. And you are only responsible for managing the data and the applications. And finally, with software as a service, you, you are just the user. You don't have to manage anything. You get everything from the software as a service provider from networking up to the application you use. Now let's have a look at a classic IT security incident. What does this mean? An incident, for instance, could be the unauthorized access to the server, which has been detected, for instance, by a server log file. Or anomalies in network traffic have been uncovered, for instance, by your intrusion detection system or your firewall logs or you have suspicious files found on one of your servers, for instance, also by the intrusion detection system, log files, antivirus, etc. These are the usual classic IT security incidents, for instance, that you can have and that you can detect on site. The approach now would be to isolate the affected server, activate the incident response team, probably notify the affected stakeholders, the users who use that server or your services, and if necessary, report to the Federal Office for Information Security, BSI, at least in Germany, because this is mandatory in Germany for operators of critical infrastructures, digital services, and tele telecommunication networks. And then, of course, you would perform forensic analysis of the incident. This would be done, for instance, by the incident response team and or appointed IT forensic experts. This is how you would deal with a classic IT security incident, for instance, in your company. Now let's have a look at the general procedure in digital forensics. First of all, the basic rule is we don't change anything as far as possible. We want to preserve evidence and not to destroy, alter, or even create it. And therefore, we always work on copies of the data, if possible. Here are the five phases of digital forensics. I took the table from securityinsider.de. This is a German page, so I translated it to you in English. The first phase is the identification phase. Here, we perform the inventory of the incident under investigation. So what happened and what do we want to do? Then we present the initial situation and we describe the questions that we want to clarify. When we finish the identification phase, we do the actual job. We perform at first the data backup in the data backup phase. All data is backed up and we determine whether the IT system can continue to operate despite the incident or if we need to shut down it to prevent more damage. After that, there is the analysis phase where we use the collected data and we analyze it. Here we perform the investigation of the system regarding the incident. And of course, we want to identify different things like the processes, the causes, and if possible, the responsible parties. Even during the analysis phase and after that, 
we perform the documentation phase. All steps that we carried out in the analysis are recorded and documented. And finally, if we work for a forensics company and we work for a customer, we perform the presentation phase. Clearly you do this for yourself also, but for the customer, this is also more, even more important to do. And in the presentation phase, the collected data and documentation are summarized in a report. And it includes facts like, the, if possible, the perpetrator identity, the extent and time frame of the act, the causes and motives. And be aware that the presentation for a company, that you usually present these to managers, so you have to not go too deeply into the technical part so that the higher and upper management understands what happened. What does it mean to secure evidence? Securing evidence means to secure digital artifacts. And a note, in today's lecture, we focus on a single machine and leave the network aside for now, at least in this introductionary part. Later on with cloud computing, clearly we only deal with servers and multiple machines. But here with a single machine, we do the following. In general, we copy the data of the hard drives we copy the data of the RAM, so the memory, the random access memory. And if we deal with virtual machines, we try or we do a copy of the virtual machine. And in detail, what are we interested in? We are interested in log files, database contents, configuration files, authentication credentials, for instance, password files or SSH keys. We're interested in electronic communication, the network traffic, then when we deal with Windows systems, we are interested in registry data and so on and so forth. So we collect many, many digital artifacts. How can we create copies of a hard drive? First of all, if we create a copy of a hard drive, you should use a write blocker. We have three solutions here. And we have first the easiest solution. We boot a Linux from a USB stick on the server, and then we create a copy using DD. You have the command for DD here. We just copy our hard drive to an image to, for instance, a USB stick or to an external hard drive. Then we have the simple solution 2.0. This is a forensic DD. It's basically the same. It boots Linux from a USB stick. Then we create a copy, but not using the standard DD tool from Linux. We use DC3DD. This is also basically DD, but it performs a forensic preservation including automatic validation of the image using a hash. Then we have uh, hardware-based solutions. Here we use disk copy devices, as you can see here, or you can see here, where you put in one disk and then you can copy the other disk. And finally, we could use additional tools like FTK Imager, GuyMager, CloneZilla, and so on. And then the analysis of the copied hard drive is performed, for example, with the tool autopsy that we will also use later for analyzing cloud or hard drive secured from the cloud. Here are some examples of digital traces that you can find on the hard disk of a computer. You can find, of course, at first file system information. Then we can find multimedia files like images, audio files, and videos. You can find text, Word, and Excel files internet history, email data, registration data from Windows, deletion logs, you can find encrypted files and containers, system and log files, and if the system was attacked by malware, of course, you can find malware and viruses. Now let's have a brief look on how to create a memory copy. I also made a video on this channel if you're interested in more details of that, but here's an introduction. The first thing you could do, we just copy the virtual machine. We create or copy the VM as snapshots. And then we have a copy of the memory also. Then we have software-based solutions that require root access to the machines where we want to copy the memory. We have different options here. We could copy the hibernation file or the page swap files. The page swap files have limited use because you don't have the complete memory in it. You can copy crash dumps when the computer crashed, it uh, copied these uh, to the hard drive and we can use these. Or you can use tools, for instance, a Belkasoft Live RAM capture for 32 and 64-bit windows. You can see here a screenshot or an image of that a RAM capture. And in the memory forensics video on this channel, we use this to copy the memory. And then we have point three hardware-based solutions. We have the cold boot attack, where you just 
reset the computer, boot another operating system, and then copy what remains in the memory. But you can also try to freeze down the memory to shut down the computer and then put the memory into another machine and try to copy it. I also go into details about that in my other video about memory forensics. And then we have the DMA attack, where you use uh, direct memory access cap capabilities of your computer. You put in a, a card into a free slot in a PCI Express slot or use USB 4.0 or Firewire, and you copy the data from the memory. And this works besides your CPU, so the CPU cannot protect your memory against that. And then finally, when we have a copy of the memory, we can use the tool volatility. And you will see this also in detail in my memory forensics video. Here are some examples of digital traces in memory. You can see executed applications like processes and threads. You can see the browser history, clipboard contents, open and closed network connections, cached files, chat messages, account login information. And for me, as a cryptologist, of course, the most interesting things are the cryptographic keys that you then can use, for instance, to decrypt encrypted containers on the hard drive. In the final phase of digital forensics, the collected data is now prepared in a report. And the content and structure of the report are the report should also be understandable for non-IT individuals. I already said that. And the summary of the steps should be written down. And this should be approximately one page. And then you write down the entire story of your investigation. What was done? Why was something done? Illustrations to explain the connections are nice. Data collected in the process we write down. And of course, our conclusions after we perform the analysis. And finally, we of course, show possible next steps. We also put these, if possible, into the report. A good general overview of forensics reporting in English you can find on forensicsfocus.com. You can see here this URL. Now, what are the challenges in cloud forensics? Keep in mind, all that we had a look at previously until now was only for digital forensics, not in the cloud. What are the problems or challenges in cloud forensics? Now, the access to data and their locality is a problem because with the server, we know where it is. But with cloud forensics, the server could run anywhere on the earth. <laughs> then we have multi-tenancy. So with a cloud computer or cloud computing solution, you have different customers on the same machine. So when we deal with an incident, we have to take care that we don't violate data or have access to data or copy data of other customers. Then, of course, data security and privacy is a concern. And then the dynamic nature, the elasticity of the cloud environment. While the one instance is currently running in the United States, five minutes later, it could run in Europe, in Africa, or China, or wherever, because that is the nature of cloud computing. Where you have free resources, instance could move. Then we have to deal with encryption. Then we have to deal with log management. So is there any or are there any log files in the cloud or do we have any? So if you set up a cloud environment and you configure your application or your server, you should implement, of course, log files. And then we have the legal and regulatory challenges. So the legal rules in the United States are, of course, different than Europe or in Asia or in China or Japan. So you have to know these and different countries have different rules according to cloud computing and what you have to fulfill with cloud computing. Now let's have a look at forensics in infrastructure as a service environment. And here's a note. Due to my experience with the use of Amazon Web Service, abbreviated AWS, for my own projects, I will limit to AWS in this lecture. Let's start with the identification phase. And before we even perform any forensics, you should take some preventive actions as a provider of a service or a server that runs in the cloud. First of all, and I already mentioned that, set up logging and monitoring of your devices in that or your services that are running in the cloud. Establish proper access control. Then perform snapshot and backup strategies. So Snapshots and backups are very important. If you have an incident, you can roll back to a running system. 
use encryption. I mean, with this channel, I don't, I, I don't think I have to empathize why this is important. Then network segmentation and isolation is important. Don't put all servers in the same network segment. If one is attacked, the attacker could gain easily access to other servers running in the same segment. So segmentate them and isolate them. Check legal and compliance requirements that are needed when you, that you have to fulfill when you run your um, cloud instance. And of course, create an incident response plan that you have a plan what to do in case of an incident. Then we had an incident. What are the actions that we have to perform after an incident as a provider who uses cloud computing? If necessary, shut down the virtual machines that are affected or disconnect them from the network to prohibit further harm. Then inventory of the incident to be investigated. Check what you need to do. Then present the initial situation, for instance, to your colleagues that you all work in the same direction. And then create a description of the questions that should be clarified during the, your analysis of the incident. And clarify general questions. Where are the affected data located? Which virtual machines is or are affected? And then how can we or do we extract the data? Do we still have access to the data virtual mach machines or did an attacker even shut this down to us, for us? Was data deleted? And of course, and it should, should be there, are there any backups? And it may be necessary to involve third parties, for instance, the cloud operator or the cloud service provider. And of course, finally, to what extent do we trust the data obtained, for instance, from the cloud provider, from third parties, or even from our systems? And now I have a more practical topic. And I thought it would be interesting to have a scenario where we analyze the cloud. And here we now change to the view of an investigator who has to analyze an illegal darknet market in the cloud. We are now IT forensic experts and have been commissioned to secure digital evidence in a criminal case for a criminal investigation. And the specific case is a suspect has operated a so-called darknet market for several months in which he illegally sold war weapons. And on the suspect's computer, there are indications of the hosting of this market as well as access data to its server. The market is presumably operated on a virtual machine using the Amazon EC2, the Amazon Cloud. Our task is to forensically secure and analyze the market server and the data located on it. Here we have the architecture overview of the illegal darknet market, how it looked like. So we have a virtual machine inside the Amazon Cloud. And on that virtual machine, we have an Apache web server we have a WordPress, that's a content management system that was used to operate the market. And then we have a Tor client that served as a server to provide the WordPress and the darknet market with internet or with darknet access. The server runs in the cloud, the server connects to the firewall, and we have this Tor tunnel that goes through the internet to the customer. And the customer could connect using the Tor browser to this darknet market. And oh, sorry, I forgot here to translate it. This here is the operator of the darknet store. And he is, of course, also the admin of the darknet store. Now I prepared a video, the introduction of the darknet market in the Tor network. Here you can see the Tor browser and you can see a Tor onion address. And we now connect it to the store. Clearly, I made up this store. This is not a real um, darknet market or store. And, but this is how it could look like. Here you can buy illegal firearms without any background checks. And of course, this is very illegal and very criminal. Now, the first thing we have to do, we have access to the server because we found the access data on the computer of the one who maintained it and now we want to extract the data and data instruction from an infrastructure as a service environment could work as i show you now if it's not your one's own cloud first of all you have to secure access permissions and we have this already but we could also contact the cloud operator and or the infrastructure as a service user <laughs> if it's not a criminal 
Then we download the virtual machines. That could be one possibility. We could download the virtual hard drive. The data set is another possibility. And we could save or would save the virtual memory of the virtual machines. Now we have a few, or we could have a few problems. The download of the virtual machine is not possible or difficult. Difficult means it's uh, very slow to copy, for instance, we will see this later. Then we could download the hard drives, or if not possible or difficult. Then we could secure the RAM if it's not possible or difficult. One problem could be that the cloud provider restricts download rates, for instance, Amazon AWS, depending on the instance model of the virtual machine. And therefore, preparatory measures are very important, at least if we are maintaining the server ourselves. Of course, the criminal didn't do this for us. Now I show you an example download of the virtual hard drive in Amazon Web Service. EC2 is the Elastic Compute Cloud of Amazon. It does not allow a direct download of volumes, virtual hard drives, but it is possible by, possible by indirect means. Option one, we export the virtual machine completely to S3, the simple storage service, and then we download from the S3. Option two is we send a copy of the virtual hard disk over the internet and using DD and then we download it. But be careful, without extra measures, this happens unencrypted. And option three is we mount an additional volume with virtual hard disk. We copy the virtual hard disk to a new disk as an image file using DD. And then we download the image file. And here also attention, depending on the instance type, AWS throttles the download to very low download rates. So this could take days to download. And option four is we force a cloud provider via court order to copy the disks for us. We will use option two, we will use DD and then send the image via network. Now we have a video two, we create a copy of the hard drive using DD and then we send the copy using net. Here we have now access to the darknet server and I send it to another machine of course, on the internet, you would have to provide an open port on your network to send the data to. And I sped up the copying process. It takes about five to six minutes here with the machine and we successfully copied it. Now that we have secured the hard drive, what to do now? We use a tool called Autopsy for the semi-automatic analysis of the hard drive. Autopsy is a graphical interface to the Thoth kit and other open source tools for digital forensics. You can download it from autopsy.com and it has a GitHub page that you can also access. We analyze the hard drive now for suspicious artifacts, images, text, databases, and so on. And actually, we might also secure and analyze the RAM of the virtual machine, but this is not part of this lecture video. It's part of another lecture video. If you're interested in how to analyze the memory of a computer, have a look at my memory forensics video on this channel. Now I have the third video, analysis of the secured hard drive using autopsy. We are here now in autopsy now and we create a new case. You have to give the case a name. For instance, darknet web server. Then you have to create it and then you can give a case number and then for the examiner some data. You can add your name, phone, email and so on. Let's add an example email and let's add some notes. And when we press finish now, we create a case for the analysis. This creates a database for the case. This takes some time. And now we created the case. Now we have to import the image that we want to analyze. You can select here disk image or VM file. And here we have our image, the hard disk image that we created from our server, from the hard drive. And then we can press next. Here we can select what should be analyzed and then it takes some time, I sped it up. And now we can perform the analysis in autopsy. You can see here a tree structure. You can see the entire hard drive here. You get some information about the hard drive and you can just browse the hard drive here. Interesting for us are now file types because we want to search for instance for images. 
and then Autopsy lists all the images that it found on the hard drive. And you can already see here, we have some interesting images. For instance, we have images of the weapons of the store that were sold, like the G3 here. We have different firearm weapons. This is all evidence that you can find on such a server. Also interesting for us could be to have a look at the operating system. It identified it as a Debian Linux. And you can open then these files where it found why it is a Debian Linux. So what did we find during our analysis using Autopsy? We found several images, image files of weapons offered in the darknet market. We found also, and I didn't show that, a price list of the offered weapons in Euro and Bitcoins. We can find, or we found the cryptographic keys to and the configuration file of the Onion URL, the Tor URL of the darknet market. You can see it here. I will probably make a video about Tor and the future on this channel. So if you don't know what Tor exactly is, what the Tor service is and what darknet actually means, you will see this later on this channel. Then we found the settings of the so-called hidden service that are the Tor configuration files of the darknet market. So we found a hidden service deal where the web server data is located on the hard drive. And we also found the port. We found usernames and passwords of the used WordPress. For instance, the administrator WordPress was Max with the password 123, for example. And we found various email addresses, a MySQL database from WordPress, Bitcoin addresses, and so on. So you can find a lot of evidence on a computer's hard drive. What did we do during the analysis? We performed documentation, of course. During the analysis, all steps performed were documented. Autopsy also helps us by, for example, creating hash values of hard drives and files. Then uh, the result report of the forensic analysis is prepared. The hard drive of a virtual server, which hosts a darknet market for weapons in the Amazon cloud was secured. This is part of the report now. The hard drive was subjected to analysis using autopsy, Various digital artifacts, evidence were secured on the server, images, text, keys, email addresses, and so on. The server could be clearly associated with the onion address accessible in the darknet. And this is very important because we can pinpoint the, the server that ran in the darknet to that server that we secured. So we can, with 100%, we can say that this is the server that was operated. And the server could be clearly assigned to the suspect since we found the access data on his PC and we could access the server. It was set up and managed by him. Now let's have a look at forensics in platform as a service environments. First of all, as a provider, we would perform also preventive actions. And reminder, with platform as a service, you develop, for example, your own web application against the interfaces of the platforms provided by the cloud provider. So we have no virtual servers to manage. Now I <laughs> forgot to translate. So we have to use the tools from the cloud provider for logging, reporting, and backup. And we have to set up our own tools also for logging, reporting, and backup that we had to do previously. In the Amazon cloud, you can use the following platform as a service services. You can use Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, and you can use, this is a, um, a platform, and then we have Amazon Relational Database Service, RDS. So basically you run your web application here and your database here. Here we have the architecture of an illegal darknet market installed in such a platform as a service environment. So now we have the RDS with MySQL and Beanstalk with PHP Apache. And the darknet would now, the store would now run or the market would run here. We would not have any darknet at all here because here's no Tor client now involved. It's directly connected to the internet. So basically from the perspective of the criminals, this is a very stupid idea, but as an example, we use it now. So our platform connects via the Amazon computers to the firewall, the firewall then to the internet, the suspect, the administrator, of course, connects through the internet to the market, and the user also connects through the internet to the market. Now, how do we extract data from a platform as a service environment? If this is not our own cloud, 
we have to secure access permissions. So we have to contact the cloud operator, in this case a criminal, or we have to get the access data from his computer, and or we have to contact the cloud operator who will then give us access. Then we have to download the web applications and scripts, source code, images, etc. We have to secure the log files and we have to secure database contents. Now, as an example, let's secure database content from the cloud. Option one is we export the database with Amazon RDS and import to a new local database. Then option two, and that is what we will do, we copy the database with phpMyAdmin if installed, otherwise install it and use it to copy. And then option three, we use specialized database forensics tools, but these are not part of this lecture. These are probably part, maybe in a later database forensics lecture. Now I have a fourth video where I show how to copy the database content using the PHP My Admin web application. Here we now log into the server with PHP My Admin. And you can see we do this even via the Tor network. And now we go to export and we want to export the WordPress database. So I select WordPress here, scroll down and click export. And now it saves the database onto my PC as localhost SQL. We have the database dump here and we store it. Now I went to my own database and I go to import and I take the exported SQL file and I import it now to my own database. So that I can analyze it on my own PC. And then you can see we have the complete copy of the WordPress database, the computer. Now that we have copied the database, what now? We analyze the content of the database with our local copy and, for example, PHP MyAdmin. We extract database entries that are relevant for evidence preservation. For instance, WordPress pages, posts, etc. And we use additional database tools to analyze the database. For that, see Database Forensics other lecture. And this is our fifth and last video. In this video here, we analyze the content of the database with PHP My App. So we are here now in the local copy, and I'm here in the users table of the WordPress, and we can see the username Max and the hash password here. We can also see the posts on the WordPress. So we have the content of the web server here that the WordPress shows to us when we go to the page. And here we found a firearm price list. For instance, AK47, 5,000 euro and so on. What are the results of the analysis? Here are two examples. We were able to extract the price list as previously mentioned of the weapons as HTML code from the WordPress database. And we also were able to extract a user from the WordPress database. Here we have the username Max. Let's assume this is the name of the guy who maintained the darknet store or the darknet market. We have his email address and the hashed password. And when the user registered to WordPress. Of course, with real databases, you can find much more evidence and information. Of course, we perform documentation and presentation. During the analysis, all steps carried out were again documented. Result report of the forensic analysis preparation. Um, what we did, the database and the website of a darknet market for weapons hosted in a platform as a service in the Amazon cloud was secured. The content of the database was copied via PHP My Admin. Here's a note. The actual website would have been, of course, secured separately. Then the website contents in the database could be secured, including a price list of the offered weapons. And the user account Max could be secured, which can be associated with the accused one. Now we come to forensics in software as a service environment. And here only some ideas because this, of course, depends on the software that you run in the cloud and how you perform your analysis. What do we do in software as a service environments? And as a reminder, with software as a service, a customer books a full application which he uses over the internet. So no cloud infrastructure and no cloud platform that we could have access to. 
And now here's an example, forensics analysis of data in Dropbox, which is a cloud storage solution you probably all know. And generally, there are two ways to access the data for, for forensic analysis. First, access the local data stored on the client device or devices, and access through the direct access of the cloud, the server side. Here's a selection of problems you could face when you do this. The local data, the client data, may not be up to date, so not synchronized. Same as for the server, the cloud data may not be up to date, not synchronized. So there may be other client devices with different possibly interesting data sets. So the data may be encrypted on the client side, then one needs to access to the client's cryptographic keys, and the cloud provider abroad and or ignores judicial orders. Then you have a problem. If your cloud runs in China or Russia and they ignore what you want, then yeah, you cannot do much. And there's something I want to say about there may be other devices with different possibly interesting data sets. It makes sense if you want to secure a computer to first not connect it to the internet, then copy the content of Dropbox and then connect it to the internet so that Dropbox can update itself and then you get the updated data. So you have the old data set and you have the new data set backup. Maybe there are interesting files that have been deleted on the server and then these are deleted from the hard drive and then you have to obtain these via other measures from the deleted parts of the hard drive. Yeah, and this brings us to the end of this video. Here's a summary and a conclusion. What uh, did we do? What did you learn in this video, hopefully? First of all, you learn what is forensics and digital forensics. This was chapter one. Then what is cloud computing and what service models are there? Chapter two, how to extract hard drive and memory data? Chapter two. And then how is forensics conducted in infrastructure as a service environments, platform as a service environments, and software as a service environments. We worked with autopsy, with PHP my admin, and with software as a service, we had only very brief considerations of cloud storage solutions, for instance, Dropbox. Here's also some literature that is interesting for the German viewers of the channel. You can use the BSE Leitfaden IT Forensic. You can download it from the BSI. Then for the international viewers, the Interpol guidelines for digital forensics first responders could be interesting. Then there's an interesting book, Security, Privacy and Digital Forensics in the Cloud. Then you get autopsy from this web page and you could of course use Amazon Cloud for your own <laughs> experiments you find it at aws.amazon.com. Yeah, and here I'm back again. So thank you very much that you made it to the end of this lecture. I hope it was interesting for you that you learned something. If you have any questions, post them below this video. Yeah, and this is everything I wanted to show you in this video. I hope you liked it. If yes, please give a thumbs up. This really helps me to grow the channel, also to make Crypto2 more popular, the software that we usually use for cryptography. Yeah, and as I said, Thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video.